Hello, I'm Pastor Aaron, and uh, we're going to talk about something today, and you might disagree with me, and that's okay. I want to get us thinking about what other sorts of Gospels there are out there. What are people saying is the good news of Jesus Christ, and is that really biblical or not? We are going to read... 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 5. Let's take a look. It says, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. The time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. So this is Second Timothy. Paul is writing to Timothy. Timothy is in the city of Ephesus which is kind of known for being a place where false teaching occurs. It was mentioned in Acts, and it's mentioned in 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy. So, as with 1 Timothy, uh, false teaching is still a problem, even in Paul's second letter to Timothy. This is still a problem just before what we read in chapter 2, 16 through 18. It says, but avoid irreverent babble, for it will lead people into more and more ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, who have swerved from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already happened. They are upsetting the faith of some. And then in just chapter before, 3 verse 8, just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also oppose the truth. Men corrupted in mind and disqualified regarding the faith. So there's still false teaching going on in Ephesus that Timothy has to deal with, and Paul is encouraging him to deal with it. Um, as I was studying for this passage, I couldn't help but think of a card game that I've played before, and maybe you've played it too. I always knew it as BS, where you have different people around the table, and the first, you, you divide up the, the deck between everybody, and then the first person has to lay down an ace, and they will lay it face down. And then the next person has to lay down a two, then a three, four, five, and so on, all the way around. So each person has to lay down different cards. If you think somebody has is laying down a card and saying that they are having a card that they are not. So, like, let's say the person to my left says, lays down a card face down and says, ace, and I have four aces, then I would say BS, because I know that they don't have an ace, and they would have to pick up whatever is in the middle of the table, all of those cards. And then the first person to lose all of their cards wins. In this game, you have to pay attention to what you have and look around and see what other people are playing. And maybe you can read by the language and other things like that too. But the idea is to call out BS. Theology is kind of the same. There's a lot of people playing a lot of cards of theology, Bible verses, and other things like that. And we need to know and be able to recognize when somebody is not teaching what is true. We need to learn how to call BS on what some people are saying. Bad theology is nothing new. Twisting the gospel is nothing new. Bad theology started in the Garden of Eden. In Genesis 3, verse 1, maybe you know this story. The serpent says to the woman, Did God actually say you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? 
And Eve responds, and the serpent replies, You will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Satan has eons of experience deceiving people, and he's very successful. He has lots of experience doing this, lots of trial and error. He knows how to get the best of people. He knows how to sneak around and poke our insecurities or our fears or whatever. He knows our weaknesses generally and our individual weaknesses particularly. And Satan's goal is to undermine our faith so that we sin. That's his goal. In Hollywood and just the general culture, Satan is often just portrayed as something scary, you know, like a topic for horror movies and such. But the Bible does not really depict Satan as scary that often, maybe occasionally. But Satan will do whatever he can to undermine our faith so that we will sin against the Lord, not trusting in what God has said. So his approach is often friendly like with Eve in the garden. Hey, what did God say? Are you sure he said that? You know, he's really holding out on you. You know, if you really want to become like God, you would just eat some of the fruit. God doesn't want that. I'm just doing you a favor. Satan comes off friendly to Eve and helpful. Same with Jesus in the wilderness. Boy, you look hungry. Why don't you turn this stone into a piece of bread? I mean, you need to eat, don't you? Why don't you do that? I'm just trying to help you out. Satan will come off friendly. He will use fear, but he'll also use other things wherever we're weak in order to undermine our faith to get us to sin. 2 Corinthians 11, 13 and 14 says, For such men are false apostles. Those were different situation in Corinth there. Deceitful workmen disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So, Satan comes off as friendly, helpful. He will do whatever he can to get us to sin, to undermine our faith, so that we don't trust God. And one of our weaknesses, one human weakness, that is kind of true for all of us here, is that our hearts get attached before our heads have a chance. We have kind of this core of desires within us, and that operates first before our mind has a chance to respond to it. So, for example, maybe you've known, you know, a young teenager or something, something where they fall in love for the first time, right? And they're just intoxicated with all of these powerful feelings of, of attachment and, and romance and they're so attached to this person that they can't see that this is not a good match. The person that they've attached themselves to is really not good. They're, they're not a, either not a good fit or, or this person might just not even be a very nice person. But they're so in love that they, you know, if you tried to tell them, hey, you know, I don't think this person is very good for you. Well, I mean you will get chewed out. I mean, how dare you violate these, these wonderful experiences that we're going through? We have a core of desires underneath rational thought, and it tends to drive a rational thought. We form emotional attachments before we mentally evaluate the wisdom in doing so. We actually like people even before we know them. So I read about a study once where they gave a bunch of people different photographs to look at. And then they said, what do you think that person is like? And the people that they asked, they guessed or basically believed that the more attractive people in the photographs had nicer personalities. It described the personalities of these people who were more attractive, similar to their personality. We are, get attached to people and like people even before we meet them. 
there was um, a friend of mine who preached a sermon series once, and he called it Heresy in the Hymns. And what he did was, is he took apart some famous hymns of the past and kind of said, is this really, really biblical? And he was kind of picking them apart a little bit. He got such a pushback and so many people upset. He only got through two sermons of that message. People were so attached to their songs that they couldn't bear to think that they might be unbiblical. We get attached to things and even when our head does catch up and say, hey, wait a minute, this might not be right. It's really difficult to disattach from things, even if it's not good or right. There's a, a nearby church here in the Christian Reformed Church, my denomination, where a pastor from the pulpit denied things that are in our statements of faith. There was no question. And after doing so, when people were raising concerns, like, this is not good. Um, this pastor had a bunch of people defending him. Oh, he's such a nice guy, and, and he's such a great preacher. He, he can captivate the audience so well. He's, he, he's a good guy. Once we get attached to someone or something, it's hard to disattach from it. We like people, ideas, activities, shows, songs, and so forth before we can think about whether it's even good or not. I hear songs on the radio sometimes, you know, just mainstream, mainstream radio. And uh, I'll hear one that, you know, it's got a nice sound to it. It's got a nice beat and, and things like that. And, and uh, my wife will say, I, I will say, first of all, that, boy, I, I like that song. That's kind of a nice song. And she's like, well, do you know what the words are? I'm like, no, I don't usually pick up words as well as she does. And then she'll start telling me the words and and I'm like, oh, I can't like that song. That's a terrible song. Very, very raunchy or inappropriate or whatever. But it's hard to stop liking a song once I've liked it. We feel before we think. This is how humans work. We feel things before we can think. This is why flattery works. This is how salesmen and women work, how they can butter us up and then sell us something because we feel before we think. This is how why we form opinions without facts. If you've ever watched Jimmy Kimmel, sometimes he'll do something called lie witness news where they make up a fake piece of news and then they go out on the street and then they ask people about this fake piece of news. So how did you feel when you heard Canada became the 51st state? Oh, I was shocked. I was so surprised by that. And well, where were you when, when you heard about that? Oh, I was getting coffee at Starbucks and, and some, were, some were mad and I heard them cursing and, and others were crying and they were really, really sad. And then others were laughing about it. We will also disagree with people even before we hear what they have to say. If you take people from one side of the political aisle or the other and tell them that their candidate said something, they will automatically like it even before it's even said. So I saw one recently where somebody, an interviewer, gave Obama quotes and told people that Trump had said them. And he went to he asked a bunch of politically left-leaning people. And these people opposed what was said because Trump said it. When they found out that Obama said it, it just blew their minds. We disagree with people or agree with people even before they say anything. Feeling before thinking is why it says in verse three here, that for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. Bad theology comes through tickled ears. It sounds nice, or it makes us feel good. It tickles our ears, it gives us warm fuzzies or whatever. It's 
it has a nice sound or it makes us feel good. This is where bad theology comes from. We need to pay attention. Right now, there's a lot of things of what I going on right now that I would just call the gospel of good feelings, where the good news is really just tailored and designed just to make us feel good or to appeal to our passions or something. And this is where you might disagree with me, but that's okay. I'm going to run the risk. I just want to get us to think about these things. So the gospel of good feelings, at least as I think of it, it comes in a lot of different forms. So I got three here. A, first of all, the prosperity gospel, or basically health and wealth are rights of believers and they're claimed by faith. Okay, maybe you've heard of the prosperity gospel before. Sometimes it's called the health and wealth gospel. And there are extreme forms of this. The word of faith movement, sometimes called name it and claim it, or positive confession, would fall into this category. Kenneth Hagin, Kenneth Copeland, Benny Hinn would fall into this category. But there's milder forms of this category too, like Joel Osteen. He wouldn't claim to be part of the prosperity gospel movement, but he says things that are in line with these things. The idea is to have health and wealth be the main part of the gospel, our success. And A, ignores the biblical value of self-denial and suffering. In the Bible, there are many places where it talks about the value of self-denial. Jesus saying, if you want to come after me, then deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. Self-denial and suffering. Jesus' path is not health and wealth. And some of the prosperity gospel people have to even make up some things in order to justify their message. One of them said one time, Jesus must have been rich in order to have Judas as a treasurer. You have to make up these kinds of things in order to preach this. But this ignores the biblical value of self-denial and suffering. That's A. B is what might be called progressive Christianity, which is basically look within yourself to find God. Or at least that's maybe one way of characterizing it. People who follow this would often call themselves spiritual but not religious. They would believe things like all religions offer a piece of the whole picture. God is everywhere and in everything, including yourself. And sin, death, and evil will be reconciled or won over and not defeated. I'm going to name some more names. Paul did, so I'm going to as well here. Richard Rohr teaches something called a cosmic Christ, where Christ is in everything. Oprah Winfrey would fall into this category. Rob Bell would fall into this category. Elizabeth Gilbert, who wrote Eat, Pray, Love, Deepak Chopra. Classic Disney films might even fall into this category. Look within to find God. B ignores the depth of our sin. It doesn't take into consideration the fact that when you look inside yourself, you might not see God's will. You might see your own will and attribute it to God. Only Jesus Christ is without sin and only he would give us the pure truth. And so we need to listen to what Jesus has to say and not look within or consider other people and other things to be God. And then there's C, which I'm taking from somebody else that was written by a couple people in a book. This is called Moralistic Therapeutic Deism. That's a mouthful. I'll say it one more time. Moralistic Therapeutic Deism. If you want to characterize it, God meets my needs. This is from the book Soul Searching 
by Christian Smith and Melinda Lundquist Denton. And they surveyed a bunch of teenagers and asked them about God and what they thought about God. And they came up with this version of religion, moralistic therapeutic deism. It's moralistic because it's about just being nice and fair. God wants us to be nice and he wants us to be fair with people. It's therapeutic because God wants us to feel good about ourselves and to just feel better when life gets us down. And it's deism because God is our creator, but God is out there, is, is a ways away. And he's out there and he can help me when I need him, but otherwise he's just out there, not involved in my day-to-day -day life. And they would characterize it or they describe it as, in short, God is something like a combination divine butler and cosmic therapist. He is always on call takes care of any problems that arise, professionally helps his people to feel better about themselves and does not become too personally involved in the process. Most of these teenagers are now adults. This is a popular view where God meets my needs. He exists to serve me. C ignores God's holiness and authority. Be holy because I am holy, says the Lord God. God is not our butler. We serve the Lord. He created us to serve him. God is not our butler. We exist to serve him, not he us. God is not our therapist that we see as needed just to make ourselves feel better or get a different perspective on things. God certainly does serve us and give us many good things. God certainly can make us feel better. But this is not what we are for or what God is for. God is holy and he has ultimate authority to give commands and speak into our lives, telling us to turn away from sin. Verse 3 of what we read gospel of good feelings in whatever form it takes is geared to our passions as it says accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and we can see this it's only natural that we would want health and wealth these are natural inclinations that we want we have a natural inclination to be like god i mean there's a healthy desire to want to be like god to want to just emulate him more, and that should hopefully lead us to follow Jesus more. But uh, as with Eve in the garden, we just want to be God. And we, it's easy for us to get lazy and to get complacent and want God to be our servant. Gospel of, gospels of good feelings are just geared to our passions. They're designed to cater to what goes on on the inside, whether or not it makes sense or it's good. And the antidote to false gospels is the whole of scripture. And that's what it says just in the part right before we picked up, chapter 3, 14 through 16, which I will read for us now. As for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. In other words, we need scripture. This is what keeps us rooted. This is how Paul uh, begins when he says, I charge you, Timothy, to preach the word and be prepared because some people are not going to be ready or accepting of the true message. The real problem that we face, according to the whole Bible, the real problem is our sin, our own sin, and we must repent of it. We have to repent from our sin. And sin is not just something that bad people do, other people. 
you know, people you see on the news or the mean people that we encounter. We have sin and we must repent of it. Our problem is not poverty or illness. Well, certainly those can be problems, but the real problem that we all face is sin, not poverty or illness, not psychological distress, not our day-to-day -day problems. Our real problem is sin and we have to repent of it. And if you look at the whole Bible, you will frequently see God becoming very frightening when it comes to sin. Just read Isaiah, Jeremiah, or Ezekiel. God gets really scary when it comes to sin and his response to it. Or look at what Jesus himself has said. A master goes away and puts a servant in charge of fellow servants to give them their food at the proper time. It will be good for that servant whose master finds him doing so as told when he returns. But what if that servant is wicked and begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with drunkards? The master of that servant will come at a day when he does not expect him and at an hour when he is not aware and he will cut him to pieces and assign him to place with the hypocrites where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The real problem is being estranged from God because of our sin and we must repent of it. The only solution to this problem is Jesus Christ and we must believe in him. We must put our trust in him. We must follow him. We must believe that he is the answer to our sins. His life, his death, his resurrection, and his ascension, his whole person and work is what saves us from our sins. And we have to believe in him and trust him that we are saved by grace and not by our works. And in trusting Jesus, we follow his rugged path of the cross that ends in eternal glory. The path of Jesus that he walked and the life that he lived was not a glamorous, glorious, troubleless life. He was a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. He died on a cross. He faced many people who didn't believe in him, and even his closest friends deserted him in his hour of need. The God of the Bible shows a love to not only his son, Jesus Christ, but all of the prophets and apostles to be a father who is both faithful and tough. God's love is tough, and he's a father not like we are, fathers and mothers. From Moses through the Apostle Paul and all of his hardships, God is not about giving us smooth sailing. Even the most faithful of us will not experience smooth sailing. Unlike us, God did not buy into the self-esteem movement of the 70s and 80s, where we have to make sure that kids always feel good about themselves. And in the process, we created what at least some researchers have called the narcissism epidemic. God the Father does not buy into the safety movement of the 90s and 2000s, which has produced uh, some risk-averse snowflakes needing safe spaces from microaggressions. God is a loving father, but his love is tough. And he is going to give us challenges. And he is going to stretch us. He is going to push us. He will be faithful in providing for us and caring for us, but he will also challenge us. And when things go wrong in our lives, sometimes it might be because of our own foolishness, but sometimes it might be like in the case of Job, God is growing us in our faith. He's teaching us to trust him more and rely on him more. And those are not pleasant lessons to learn. But as kids, we didn't always like everything that our parents 
had us do either. God the Father wants to raise us into spiritual adults, and that's not always pleasant. But we live in times, as did the apostles, and since the beginning, we live in times when there is bad theology, gospels of good feelings, and so forth. And there's a lot of things that sound sweet, appealing to our own passions that have heads of their own, even before our minds can work. With a lot of sweet-sounding BS out there, we need like Paul's uh, instructions to Timothy here, always be sober-minded. We need that. We need to be sober-minded because we might be attached to things that are not good for us to have attachments to. Be sober-minded. We need to know the Lord as he has revealed himself, not as we would like him to be in any way. We need to say to the Lord, hallowed be thy name. What does the first request of the Lord's prayer mean? Hallowed be your name means help us to really know you, to bless, worship, and praise you for all your works and for all that shines forth from them. Your almighty power, wisdom, kindness, mercy, or justice, mercy, and truth. And it means help us to direct all our living, what we think, say, and do, so that your name will never be blasphemed because of us, but always honored and praised. We are to say, hallowed be thy name, Lord, and thy will be done. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Our Father in heaven, um, Lord, thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to take away all of our sins. And Lord, for all of us, everyone listening and myself included, Lord, teach us to repent of our sin, to disattach from things that are not of you, that just appeal to our passions, but are undermining our faith and giving us a distorted vision of who you are. Lord, let us not succumb to the gospel of good feelings in whatever form it takes, but to look to you as you truly are and to follow Jesus as he truly is. In the name of Jesus, amen.